Christian Pulisic, amazing Fortnite player as well. Um, we like to have him whenever whenever one of us is out. You gotta have him, have him sub in a little bit. He's, Ooh, he's yeah. really good can't, too. Can't have him in the first team, right? Got to make time zone. Spot. Time zones are a little weird for him, and, and also he's <laughs> playing on different servers, so he's lagging a little bit. But that's like <laughs> it, he's like I'm lagging, I'm lagging, and it's like come on, dude, you just got bought, you know. <laughs> Oh, from New York, New York, you are listening to Extra Time, driven by Continental from Vacaville, California, for only two more shows. I'm Andrew Weeby with my partners in soccer. Haven't done the O New York, New York. Haven't done, you know, I've listened to the show. I've felt a little nostalgia. I felt like I've been left out. I wanted to drink some brown liquor the other night with you guys, but, you know, didn't get it done. So- Maybe Charlie's you know, had I have another experience. baby. Did you know that? Everybody know that? That's that's clear. We've heard. Congratulations. Charlie's yeah, yeah. had this experience before. For me and Doyle, I think it's kind of new to have this like make a wish style thing where our biggest fan gets a chance to come on the show and be a part oh, of this. Exactly. If anyone knows, as Andrew was off ETR, there's not a bigger, more interactive fan with extra time than Andrew Weeby. And now he gets a chance to join the show. So I'm pretty excited for you to have this once in a lifetime opportunity. Yeah, also, know, also, I have true. to say, Gus, round of applause Thank for you. how you handled the Boom. hosting responsibilities. You, you know, did a and fantastic that's why, job. Charlie, that's why I knew I could walk away from a month. I have the utmost faith in David Goss to just keep this machine running, to keep it irre- irrelevant and irreverent at the same time, whatever, either one of those, whichever way you want to go. I had faith in you, Dave. <laughs> It, we do right. have mailbag. Yeah, that's that's it both. It's irreverent and it's relevant. We do have mailbag saying I should be the permanent host. I think my mom really? texted that in, so you got to watch your back. But, you know, okay. that, that's what keeps players on their toes. I just nope. want to say, I want to add one thing. This is the first time in a month I've actually gotten the email for the show rundown. So I am very glad to have you back, <laughs> Weeby, because apparently Gavin uh, does not have my email address. Boo, 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 boo. Here we go. By the way, I was Still thinking about it. this. And I was thinking about the final because this is the final preview show. MLS is back. We've gone through 50 some games. There's one left Orlando City, Portland Timbers. Basically, nobody predicted that. We'll get to that in a second. Tuesday, 8 30 p.m. Eastern, ESPN, ESPN Deportes in the U.S., TSN, Tevia 2 in Canada. I was thinking about it, though, from Orlando's perspective. And when they came in the league in 2015, you know, they're riding this wave and they're winning USL championships and Dom Dwyer is doing backflips and it's wonderful, right? And they have Kaka and they have 50-some thousand at the, what was it? Is the Citrus Bowl in Orlando? And mm-hmm. I was thinking... Camping World what? Stadium. Camping World Stadium now. <laughs> Sorry. Bowl. Excuse me. Excuse me. And I was thinking, what was more likely to happen first? Orlando City gets to a final... Or I, in 2015, have two kids. And I just want to say smart money was on Orlando, but I gave them a bad beat. So I feel pretty good about that. I feel pretty good about that. Uh, and then the last thing I want to say, having listened to the show now that I'm back, I just want to express this sincere belief that we have been played by Adrian Heath for the better part of a year. He's just fiddling us at every opportunity. He knows what's going to happen when he steps on that dais. He knows we're going to dig into it, and we should make a pact right here, right now, to never talk about that underdog trope in the looms ever again. They are the favorites always. Expectations that come with the favorites, they're on Minnesota. If they lose, they choked. If they win, no big deal because they were supposed to win. And as the final bulletin board gift, I'm doubling down on my doubt that they ever do anything, and they're definitely not going to sign Babella Reynoso. So prove me wrong, loons. Let's get to the final preview. Uh, And we'll start with this. Bizarro world for the trophy case. MLS is back trophy. That's what's on the line. Plus CCL spot. I heard you guys talk to, talking about that. Either of these teams, I'll take them in the tournament. And then a bunch of cash for the players. Uh, who is who is the favorite? Is there a favorite? Should there be a favorite? And why is every neutral or am I just thinking that rooting for Orlando City? It feels one, like gonna, Orlando City is the team, man. One, I'm going to tell you, Heath, Coach Heath never got into got in under my skin or <laughs> made me go a certain way. So the, my mentality is too strong. For that. That's one. Two, I think everyone has, has been really surprised with Orlando and how far they've come under Oscar Perea, me being included. Uh, literally putting a philosophy, a foundation, having them all buy into the system, and, and then just seeing Nani, uh, how how well he's he's played and and how he's he's putting in the effort on both sides of the field. You, you get the 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 cocky swag from Nani being, you know, one of the elite wingers in in world football at one time, 
to him really buying into being a leader and a captain uh, on this side. I think it's quite impressive how Oscar um, ha- has gotten these guys to just listen and, and, and really um, kind of play at with, with everything that they have and make the most of the players that he has on this roster versus a Portland side that has ha- has experience has been in this um, position before being in the 2018 MLS cup final uh, just has guys that have had, you know, a ton of success in MLS. And, you know, when you look at this game, I think Portland are, are the favorites. Um, and, and, but Orlando have done everything to put themselves in a position where they can win this game. They absolutely can. But I think Portland had are heading into this one as, as the favorites. Can I just read this pray hot quote? Because I can literally, like, I can close my eyes and I can hear Oscar saying this. And he said this after Minnesota. And it goes along with what you were saying, Charlie, about listening and about the change and this rapid change that came to a club that had, A, seen a lot of rapid changes because this is the sixth coach in their five-year history and had never seen success before, like, at all, other than this run to the Open Cup last year. Quote, I'm proud they're getting the results because they're doing it, respecting their ways, They don't do it in just any form or way. They do it respecting the idea that has been proposed from the beginning. That is Oscar Pereja. I I can like, I can hear his voice say that like the intonations, the way his face looks, the sincerity. I mean, and that's why I think that Orlando city and maybe again, this is just me, somebody at the beginning of the tournament who said team chaos, I want Orlando to do well and then got to follow it and see it happen. There's just something about them. That's almost like Minnesota last year where you finally see a group come together and think, oh, no, we can do this. We can kind of move on from the misery. We can say that there's a new era in our club. We can do something we've never done before. And, oh, by the way, we're going to do it. Now, the question is, does it matter if they win the final or not? I think it really does matter. Like, they can feel great about this, but they need that moment as a club to just kind of cement this and say, we did it, move on, no disappointment, no regrets. We have this trophy. We did it in our city. We did it in crazy circumstances. This club is different. It's changed for good. And they'll have a lot of that if they don't win it. But I I think just for everything they put into it and everything that they've done, I think to not win it at this stage would just be, it would be painful. And I don't think it throws off what they're doing, but it changes the narrative just that little, little bit. I disagree. Yeah. Charlie's shaking his head too. I disagree. I'm also not a like rings person, but the way they played against LA, like what they did. Let me just interrupt. Knicks and yep. Jets fan. Knicks and Jets fan. So and Mets. Fan. And Mets. Yeah, yeah. Definitely not um, a real Yeah. Unlike Doyle, who roots for take out Paige and see who won most recent championship and then read it <laughs> oh. all. Um, but I think the way they played in the group stage was great. But then what they did against LAFC to not just go toe to toe, but to dominate or not dominate, but control the game against the best team in the league last year. Um, I think the way Nani's played, the way they've played, it's not being bunker and counter they've broken presses they've been gorgeous to watch at times and then they've been the aggressor a lot of times whatever it was that they were trying to reset in the club has been reset Uh, they play a different way they have a different perception of themselves and I think the teams in MLS have a different perception of them and I think their fans understand that something has changed and the way I would disagree with what happened with Minnesota is the players haven't really changed it's the mindset of the club from top down that's changed with Oscar Pereja and they've shown that they can be competitive no matter what. And I think Oscar Pereja always says this, but they will be competitive no matter what. And I think all of that has shifted. It would be great to win this. It would be fantastic to get a spot in CCL next year because that's a long-term thing that now over the next few months and year, you can push to and say, this is where our team's going and this is our new identity and we're a continental club and we want to be a global club and all those things. Uh, But I think a lot of the changes that a fan wanted to see has happened. Yeah, I agree. Look, I don't think those are going anywhere. I guess what I'm saying is that they've gone through this crazy journey and you want that culmination, right? You want that sort of moment of relief, of just sort of pure celebration to say, okay, it's over and we did it. Because everything that they've done so far in their history has been, we didn't do it. You know what I mean? Like either we got close and it didn't happen or we never got close at all. And I'm not saying this would be- I don't think they ever got close. They got to the semifinals against Atlanta last year and they played the game at home, right? But yeah, now they got saying. To They've final. never been there before. So why not get it done at home no, no. in this situation? You don't know don't how long you're going to have Nani. Weeby, what? they don't want to lose, but you cannot say it when doesn't you walk take out of this away. tournament, I get it. 
that there's no takeaways or anything has been changed. I didn't changed say that. I didn't say that. I'm just saying the culmination is important for them. Weeby, I, so, think, that, I think there's actually more pressure on, on Portland in this regard. Oh, I agree. Because, I agree. Because it, they've had Diego Chara and Diego Valeri for almost a decade. And these are, I think we all agree, uh, top five, respectively, at their position, the, the number 10 and, and the number six and in, in MLS history. And it's kind of incredible that they only have one – one title, one trophy of any sort to mm-hmm. show for the Chara and Valeri era. And you don't know what's going to happen in the subsequent regular season. You don't know what's going to happen next year. Like Diego Chara is amazing and he's 34 and he's playing like he's 25. Um, but these are extremely weird circumstances. And we all know that the travel and, you know, year long grind in MLS, that, adds a level of wear and tear that in a way this tournament hasn't. So I think if you want to talk about narratives, uh, which, you know, oh, I do, oh, you, do. Oh, I'm you back, really baby. do. I think the narrative is there has to be much more pressure on Portland, given what they've spent, given what these two guys have represented to not just the club, but the entire league. This might be their last chance. This might be their last chance to get a second title of any sort during this wonderful era with these two hall of fame caliber players. Um, Whereas I think with Orlando city, win, lose or draw on Mm -hmm. Tuesday night, they, they have just captured the imagination of not only their fan base, but the entire MLS fan base. And they're, they're playing this game with house money. Um, And you don't get to do that in a final uh, all that often. So maybe that's where it is for me when I say I think they not that they need to win it, but that it would be a culmination. Maybe it's my imagination. Maybe it's that I just want to see them so bad have that moment of glory after just so many sort of beaten down Orlando moments over the years that they finally sort of get to they get to have that relief. You know, because yes, you're happy and you're proud to get to the final if you're Orlando and you know that the foundation is set and things have changed. But there is nothing like that moment to just kind of let it all melt away and have that communal celebration, both with your fan base and within your team, and to have something to say, that's ours. It's in the trophy cabinet. We accomplished it. I mean, it'd be nice five years from now to be like, hey, that was cool when we got the MLS's back tournament. But that's not the same as pointing in there and saying, that's the first trophy we won. That's the symbol of the change in our club and why things change. Now, what does that trophy mean? Andrew from KC, which 100% is not me. I always put Andrew from Brooklyn when I do this. Uh he starts with, my name's Andrew, and I'm from Kansas City. So that kind of is a flag, but it's not me, I promise. He says, as the MLS Pack Tournament final approaches, wondering what your thoughts are on this. Do you think the team that wins this tournament should be recognized for winning a, quote, trophy the same way a team would receive recognition for winning the Open Cup or MLS Cup? In short, should MLS's back champions be recognized for winning basically a major trophy, or is this tournament just not as significant? I, I would say Yes. It is a significant trophy because all teams were dealing with the same issues. Um, and, and it takes a, a certain amount of desire and will to play in front of, um, you know, America without fans and to be inspiring to, to that team chemistry to come together and say, you know what, we got to dig deep. We want to win this trophy. Uh, we want to win that extra cash, but we also want CCL. We want to play in that CCL competition because that World Club Championship is such an amazing goal, and it, it's it's dangling right there. And you, again, more money. Um, <laughs> but but I I definitely think that either club, whoever win this, this isn't a, a asterisk. You're not going to have an asterisk next to to the to the MLS's back tournament because guys actually came with it they brought their a game the quality of play was was surprisingly high from what i expected i've loved this tournament i've been yeah. i've been so pleased with 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 the the style of play especially um when you look at orlando what they've come from and, and how entertaining they've been it's not a, there's no fluke when you watch orlando city play and, and why they're in the final we've proven to not only ourselves and our fans but to the league we are here to compete. We are here to challenge. And it's the mentality that Oscar has changed that they, they, they can win. We can win. We deserve to be playing against LAFC. We deserve to be in the playoffs. We deserve to be competing for things because we are, we have the squad, we have the talent. And so I, I really do think that this tournament is, has, um, is worth every penny 
as far as leaving your families for six weeks or so to compete. So I would add on, I think Charlie spot on with the way it's been played, the quality we've seen. We also had Caleb Porter on this show and he talked a little about the regular season group stage games, how much they mean compared to the next stage. We saw every team do everything they could to win those games, but every team's continued to roll out their best players. The way NYCFC used Maxi Morales and a few more examples of, of like teams have done everything they can to win this. It has not been used as a testing ground or a way to give guys minutes inside of the restraints of quarantine and the way players have trained and, and all that. Uh, teams have done everything they can and everyone's been in the same condition. So I walk away from it, same as Charlie saying, whatever team wins has done the best of all of the MLS teams that were in this, which is all of them except Dallas and Nashville, that did everything they could to win it. And therefore, you are the top of the heat. I think that's the point, right? It would be disrespectful to these guys as the, the players, the coaches, the staffs, as professionals to say that this was just some like, like hoo-ha walk in the park, right? Like that, that to me, that's disrespectful of the efforts that they put in and of their profession of what they're trying to do. Like to say that, oh yeah, you guys were just jacking around. You weren't, this wasn't serious. This was like, this was preseason. It clearly wasn't. I mean, we're gonna have Walker Zimmerman come up in just a second. He's gone through three preseasons. You think they didn't, they weren't itching to get an opportunity to prove themselves, to show what they've been doing, to show what they did in the off season? Like to me to say that it doesn't matter is just so flippant of the efforts that the people put in to make it happen and then to compete at that level that I don't even, I don't even want to like, I don't even want to consider the possibility that's not, is it MLS cup? No, it's not. Is it open cup? No, it's not. Is it CCL? No, it's not. Is it supporter shield? No, it's not because it's a frigging pandemic year and everything is crazy and different. It is what it is. It may never happen again, or it may happen as you guys talked about on the last show as kind of a preseason exercise or something that might mean less, but this is regular season for three games for every year. This is an opportunity to like prove your mettle. You think Bob Bradley went home and was like, no biggie. We lost again in a knockout stage, but it doesn't matter. So all good. No, that's not, that's not the way look these at, guys look think. Look at Atlanta United. Yeah. They fired yeah. Their, yeah. They, they, you fired a manager because of this tournament, because of performances, regardless of the times that shows right there, the importance of this tournament and the matches that were played in this bubble. If you didn't come, if you didn't play a right way or an attractive style or live up to expectations, you were held accountable. Atlanta United dropped their manager, who they've spent a lot of money, they invested a lot of time and, re and resources into hiring Frank DeBoer, and now you, you cut him loose because the performances weren't there. The style of play wasn't there. The dream of Atlanta United carrying on from what they, they built with Tata Martino was not there. So see you later. That's what happened. Deuces. All right, Doyle, let's talk about the game. We've we've gone into we hit the narrative pretty hard there. And of course, your preview is always a must read at MLS Soccer.com. So. <laughs> hey, you know what? You're getting the narrative, you're on the narrative train, and you know what? Your text messages are blowing up with sentence fragments. So yeah. mute me right now. Mute me right now, because I'm not going anywhere. Uh your tactical breakdown of the game, Doyle. What is the big theme? What are you watching for? What decisions are being made by the managers that matter? And so the the big theme overall is that Orlando City have played the best soccer in this tournament. They have been the best team in this tournament. But if Orlando City need to beat you, they really only have one guy that I trust to put the ball in the back of the net, and that's Nani. Um, whereas Portland, they've played really well. I don't think they've been quite as irresistibly good as Orlando City. But they have like three, four different guys at this point who you trust to score big goals in big games. Um, so just based on talent, looking at it, I think Portland have the advantage. But in terms of what's been happening on the field, what Orlando have done, and they did it against Montreal with Victor Wanyama, who's an English Premier League veteran in the prime of his career. And then they did it in the semifinals against uh, – against uh, Minnesota United, against Ozzy Alonso, who is, for my money, the best defensive midfielder this league has ever seen, they've been able to use Mauricio Pereira as sort of a decoy. And you could see him act in the second uh, Orlando City against Minnesota. You could see him actively come get 
Ozzy Alonso just to engage him and pull him out of central midfield. And once that happens, that clears out zone 14, and then Nani will tuck inside, or sometimes Chris Miller tucks inside, and he could do that pretty well at times. Um, and they're able to go at a sort of scrambling defense who aren't quite sure who to pick up. It's been brilliant to watch Oscar Pereja game plan for this exact thing week after week after week, but still at the same time, not give up on the idea of playing out of the back. So that speaks to what Portland have always done so well, which is have Diego Chara sit and destroy or range and destroy. The key is if he ranges and destroys build-up play, then Eric Williamson, who's been one of the breakout players of this tournament, has to recognize that and has to immediately slide in and go from that number eight role that he's been playing to a number six. Because if they leave the Portland center backs exposed, those center backs are in trouble. They've been good, but this is not like prime 2018 Red Bull central defense that we're talking about here. These guys need protection. So I think the... All of this is to say that Portland's going to give Orlando City the ball. Portland's going to draw. I don't think they're going to press them because it just we've seen time and again that if you press Orlando City, you're going to spend a ton of energy for minimal rewards. So I think Portland's going to draw a, a mid or even deep block at the start, invite Orlando City upfield, and then try to get out and hit in transition. The big question, though, is who's going to be on the field from the start for Portland? Because if you start with Diego Valeri as the 10, that probably means Sebastian Blanco, who's been the MVP of this tournament, is at left wing. And that means he's in a more defensive role because he has to track Juan. So it, there's a lot of moving pieces here for, I, I think, for Portland in particular, whereas with Orlando City, the 11, if everybody's healthy, it kind of writes itself and you know what you're going to get from Oscar Pereja. But Gio Sadarese has some decisions he needs to make. Anyone? You guys, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I've been watching this thing. <laughs> uh, like I've been watching while I give kids baths. So like tactically, I'm going to leave it to Charlie and Dave. Yeah. Uh, for for me, it's the the outside backs for Portland in, in every match we've seen Orlando overload those sides. Huan and Mueller uh, propose a lot of problems, but also the strong side of Orlando City when you talk about Nani and Moutinho and their relationship and how that's grown throughout this tournament. It's a lot of work for Viafania and, and Duval. And we've seen how the teams have exposed Viafania. He likes to get forward sometimes. He doesn't track back necessarily uh, the right way. Duval's more defensive, uh, but not as pacey when you talk about Moutinho uh, using his pace to overlap around Nani and his influence in the attacking half. There, there's a lot of questions with that. Blanco, if he is on the left, we know he drifts inside and he's going to try and create those mismatches. And it's going to be down to Eric Williamson being able to get outside and, and cover for Blanco when he does tr track inside because Juan is so pacey. He gets forward. He'll get to the end line. Williamson's going to be tasked with cutting inside. And, and that relationship between Viafania and, and Williamson, who takes Mueller, who takes Juan, uh, that's going to be a, a big part of the match where I'm going to have my eye on. Uh, and, and down the spine, I think Portland has, has the advantage here. Uh, you talk about Zuparic, Mabiala, Antonio Carlos, and Robin Janssen. I, I would take the center backs of Portland, although Antonio Carlos has looked fantastic in this in this tournament. Uh, Williamson and Chara over Rossell and Mendez. And then Valeri and, and Perea. I mean, Perea has been fantastic, but Valeri, when he's fit and healthy, even at his age right now, you're going to give it to him. And then Abobasi, Akindele, you're going to go Abobasi all day um, at the it's moment. Charlie. Even Nishkoda. Charlie, do you think that Valeri starts as the 10 then and then Blanco ends up on the left wing? You're talking about an MLS Cup tournament final. You better start Valeri. You Ooh. better start Valeri from the get-go. I think he's going to do everything um, in his power to make sure he's fit and feeling 100% or close to it for a final. Charlie, you, you just you start him. All the work Williamson's going to have to do with Huan yes. mm -hmm. and Mueller. Now you're leaving Nani one v one with Duval. So if you bring Bl if you're, you start, you're gonna, have to, you're gonna have to leave one. You're gonna have to leave one of them one v one, and you're not, gonna have to no, not if you have someone who plays on the right who will help, and that maybe that's packing the midfield with three guys who are gonna work 
And maybe that's Paredes getting a start alongside the other two guys, or it's Andy Polo who Gio Savarese loves and has done everything he can to get him on the field, starting on that right or starting in middle with the other two. No, if no you're saying what. you're giving up the ball, mm -hmm. then I don't know that it's so easy to have Valeri and Blanco on the field at the same time. Now, if you don't start Valeri in this game, mm -hmm. I think it's more than MLS's back final. This is a new chapter in Diego Valeri's time in Portland. So it's bigger than a decision around this one game. This yeah. is That would be Savarese putting a, a line in the sand saying this is the identity of the club going forward. Uh, and I don't know that Valeri's there, and I don't know if it's best for the team. I just but don't there see is that happening. reasons to believe you wouldn't. I, I just don't see Valeri coming off the bench in the final. Uh, if unless he's laboring or he doesn't feel like he's up to the challenge to, to start and play at least 60, 70 minutes, if that's how he's feeling right now. But if he's fit and feels, Hey, I'm okay to play. I don't imagine him coming off the bench. And I think the, the bench plays a big uh, part of this because Portland has the advantage with Andy Polo and Yashkota coming off the bench. Those are our weapons. And you're talking about injecting them into a match where they're going to give you something on the offensive side and they, they will work defensively. Uh, Blanco, he's going to be on the field. And I do think he's going to start on the left side with Valeri playing underneath um, Ibobasi. And they're going to try and make Orlando adjust to how they play. And you're going to, you're going to sit back and take, and take that initial pressure. But I do feel at times they will press, they will try and change things up and, and put guys under pressure. It's all about reading the game. You're not going to sit into one, uh, sit sit back and defend for 90 minutes of the game. There's going to be times where Portland have possession. There are going to be times where Portland feels like, okay, now's a good time to counter press. Let's go and try and win it back. And if we don't, we go back into our shell. And Diego Chara's are going to be a, a, a pivotal uh, player in this match for Portland because we've seen when he's started attacks, he's started counterattacks by himself, by hunting the ball down, winning it, and then just – using his burst of pace in that first three or four or five steps to start a challenge, to start a counterattack. I think he, him and Eric Williamson, that dynamic is, is, is the match for Portland. If they can find the balance of defending, attacking, that'll be the, 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 um, the, the, w the way that Portland really find their way into this game. Look, I love the stars. You guys know that. And I love Sebastian Blanco and Nani's been just unreal. Uh, but the thing that got me the most jacked about that conversation right there is how much has been put on Jean Moutinho, who was looked at as kind of a bust, honestly, after the LAC, LAFC adventure. And then Eric Williamson, who was just kind of out in the wilderness for a while. And look, you know, Timbers 2 is not the wilderness, but we haven't seen them it is, promote though. a ton of guys. <laughs> team where he played zero look, games. Yeah, it's in the yeah, it's in the trees a little bit, you know. It's, you're you're you know you're camping a bit, but now oh, if you see boy. him make this huge jump, like those are the things about this tournament that gets me so excited. But neither of those two guys are going to win the player of the tournament. Adidas player of the tournament. Am I wrong to say it's a two horse race? It's Sebastian Blanco or it's Nani? Wrong. Could Jeremy Abobasi? I mean, let's no. say he gets two goals in the final and he's up to six and he's one behind Rossi and Golden Boot. I mean, it's it's is it those two guys? Is that it? Done and dusted. It yes. should be those two guys, but if somebody scores a hat trick in the final, that guy will probably win player of the tournament. That's just well, we're already, people, not if people the voting already, is, is before the match. The voting is before, <laughs> which is crazy to me. It hasn't even happened yet. Right now, the four you can vote on on MLS Twitter, Nani, Andre Blake, who had a wonderful tournament, but you better not be voting for him. He's not in the final, folks. Diego Rossi, okay, look, he could win young player if you want him to. Don't vote for him. It's Blanco or Nani among those four in the vote. How do you get the best out of Luis Nani? Like, how does Oscar Preja set up his team, set up the matchups to get what we saw against Minnesota out of the most accomplished player who will be on that field, let's say, on Tuesday night? I mean, what he did in the class and the ease with which he did it, I was yelling, and my in-laws were like, what? Like, why are you yelling at your phone? Well, it's because Nani did the impossible. Well, it's, so it's, you just continue to do what they've been doing, which is play beautiful football. And connecting passes. And when teams press, who can who can play out of pressure? Antonio Carlos, their center back, has been able to break pressure on his own. And they're just being able to move players and, and whether it's Cash Mueller on the sideline and getting him involved and getting being able to beat people on the dribble 1v1, using your outside wingers, whether it's uh, or your fullbacks, whether it's Moutinho, whether it's Huon, being able to open up the field and, and play from touchline to touchline – I know Goss talked about being able to play those long switch balls and be and do it effectively. They've been able to do that. When you do all of that, you're freeing up space for Nani. 
because you can't just focus on Nani with this Orlando City side, which has been, uh, I think, something that's been great to see is they're hitting you from all different angles. Now, Nani might be the only one who's been able to finish and, and make it look and, and put the ball in the back of the net or create, but they're generating chances with other players and they're being able to use all, all areas of the field. And Charlie, when you look at a soccer game for a coach, for a manager, whatever, how are we going to create chances? There are ways that you think you can guarantee it. Nani 1v1 against anyone in the world is a guaranteed opportunity. That's how good he's been. He hasn't always been a dominant player. He didn't step up and become Ronaldo for Manchester United after he left. But you isolate him 1v1 with any fullback on the planet, he's going to get an opportunity away more times than not. And Tesho Akindele doesn't finish, but he does the work to pull center backs away. And Doyle talked about Pereira pulling away defensive midfielders, and then Moutinho being aggressive on the overlap, and you have so much pressure from Juan that you can't shade over to that side. And you look at the goals against Minnesota, and it's a long ball, but it's 1v1 with Dotson isolated, and it's 1v1 with Dotson again, and he's able to come inside and shoot. And if you can get Nani in 1v1 chances, you are going to create opportunities because that's how good he is. I'm going to make you cast your vote now, basically, Doyle, and make you make a prediction on this game via that vote, who is going to be the Adidas MLS's back player of the tournament? Will it be Blanco or will it be Nani? Because whoever's team wins, that's basically who it's going to be, right? I, I already told you I voted for Andre Blake. The voting's already open, man. Oh, my God. Just, I, you know, I, I, it, it feels time. normal to me. I, like, I just, Maybe to be UConn, trolled. UConn, to, UConn, to UConn. To be just, like, in the most, like, innocent, like, oh, you me, me troll? No, no. The tournament is already over. Um, so I voted for Andre Blake. Get out At least here. Doyle trolled you. Normally he just tells me to read his column. Really? <laughs> I haven't even been getting response. Well, I just retweet his column so that he can't say that oh, to me. Boy. That way he like, you know, I never actually read it. I just retweet it. No, I'm just kidding. I, I like, always read both it. Both these guys have, have, have been awesome. I, I think that Blanco has been a cut above every other field player in this tournament because to, to, to expand on the dis discussion about Nani, part of what, has sort of unleashed him during this tournament is Moutinho playing higher and wider and yet still having a ton of usage. Like if you look at the, their buildup when they go on that left-hand side, a lot of, all of it is, is funneling through Moutinho. So that's taken stuff off of Nani's plate and allowed him to just be an attacker, which is not to say he hasn't helped out in terms of breaking the press and in terms of defense because he has, um, but it's like he has a very clear, um, number one responsibility. Whereas with Blanco, his number one responsibility has been to get on the ball, to dictate the pace of the game, to create chances, to finish chances, to finish set. Like Blanco has had to do everything and he's had to do it at two different spots on the field. So I, I think if you're choosing between one of these two guys, it's probably Blanco. Um, but we all know that the, the real MVP with, with these types of tournaments is almost always – the guy who's hoisting the the championship trophy at the end um and that's when Luka modric comes in and, and you know crashes you know crashes our our uh our, our little discussion here and reminds everyone who was a 2018 world cup mvp so nice who's gonna win this give me a quick prediction we don't gotta belabor this point portland are the are the favorites says charlie orlando are you know sort of the underdogs they're the the ones that in our hearts we might be or I'm rooting for. I can't I'm sorry, I keep saying we when it's me. Give me a name. Go I around the room. I think you look at this. Everything we've said is Orlando has different ways to control the game. They can also sit back if they have to. Um, they're playing at this high level. They've done it even without Junior Urso for a ton of games. To me, everything's pointing to Orlando, except for the fact that Sebastian Blanco is probably the best best player on the field. So I'm gonna go with the Lions. Charlie. I'm going to go Portland. I think it's a really close one. I think it's 2-1. I think maybe 1-0 or 2-1. But I think Portland win in this one because of Sebastian Blanco. He's had a goal and an assist in every single match in this tournament. The like, only player. The only player. He's the MVP. Easy. Easy. Although if Orlando won, then it'd be <laughs> Oh, oh, oh that, Easy. Easy. Well, yeah, because the voting is now. So without that final... The rightful MVP right now should be Sebastian Blanco. Okay, we've got one and one. You, where are you going with this, Doyle? I want to hear yours first. I want to hear Fine. yours first. I, you know what? It's like a reverse jinx. I'm going Portland. And the reason being, I just think in a final, 
Portland has more potential wet match winners, in my opinion, than does Orlando City. There's just yeah. more guys that, that can hurt them. And they also have the history of success on their side. And I do think in these moments, despite it being bizarro world pandemic tournament, that does tend to matter. And those players do come out. Uh, and, and like Charlie said, I would take, I think, just the, the core of the Timbers, the back six, I would take them over the core of Orlando City, both on experience and just on, on quality across the board. I would take the back six of Orlando City over the back six of... of okay, Florida. so maybe I'm thinking more the the middle four. I'm thinking more middle four, but anybody would do... The, the attack. I'm okay. thinking of who, who can put the winning goal in the back of the net, and it's Blanco, it's Valeri. I think Obobese is in the process of showing that he's at that level, given what he did you know, in the 2018 uh, MLS Cup run, during... during what he did last year in the open cup, getting the winner at LAFC um, and, you know, based upon what he's done in this tournament. So that's three guys. Then you have Nishgoda as well. I think Orlando city have played the best soccer in this tournament. I think Portland have more weapons. Portland's going to win. They're also, I think slightly more dangerous on attacking set pieces as well. So it's just like one more little check that you want to put in that box for the Timbers. 8.30 p.m. Eastern, ESPN, ESPN Deportes in the U.S., TSN, TVA 2 in Canada. Watch this thing on Tuesday night. Uh, of course, the MLS Back pregame show presented by Wells Fargo. It's going to be Charlie, Kaylin, Susanna, 8 p.m. Preview, Twitter, Facebook, MLSsoccer.com, then the postgame right after the show. I kind of said that nobody predicted this. That wasn't entirely true. Two people did, and they're the only ones with perfect brackets so far, and one has the Timbers, one has Orlando. There's $10,000 on the line in the Amazing. bracket challenge. Wow. So there's some cashola going to go around and then a thousand dollars to the MLS stores a second. And then this is a nugget I just want to add before I get out of here, Charlie, I'm happy to be back on IR with you. I know you've held it down really well, but Catherine Nesbitt will be the AR one in this game. She's going to make history as the first female official to work the final of an MLS competition. So Catherine's done a kick-ass job. Uh, she's a great AR, great referee, and I'm so happy to see her get this opportunity. Uh, let's just hope. An instant replay, we're not calling anybody's name out. We're just applauding and saying, hey, every call was spot on. Ismail Alfath is the uh, referee, and then it's Nesbitt and Kyle Atkins as the ARs, and Joe Dickerson is the fourth, and Alan Chapman up in that VAR booth. Uh, you know, we talked about the award here, but the All-State Goalkeeper of the Year, just just go vote Andre Blake, I think, on that one at MLS Twitter. Who's the young player for you, though, Doyle? Moutinho, Aronson, Rossi, or Akinola? Who would you give I it already, to? I already put my vote in for Moutinho. He's been a game changer for uh, for Orlando City, and he's not going to win it because Diego Rossi scored seven goals. Um, but what Moutinho has done going from bust to like every game, there are people in my Twitter mentions being like, hey, can, can the U.S. national team add this guy to the player pool? Like he's been he's been that good. He's been worth that amount of hype. He's been excellent. How does how does Thomas Hassel not get into this? He's a 21 year old goalkeeper. He was in the goalkeeper one. So, so you know. Who Rossi cares? got the double up. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Who are you going to take out? I mean, Akinola, Aronson? No, I Rossi? don't disagree with that. But, yeah, Hassal should win everything. So, I don't know. <laughs> I appreciate the stand love there. All right, let's yeah. uh, let's keep it rolling. Of course, watch the game Tuesday night. Thursday, we'll wrap it up. Uh, you may have seen this weekend return to play for Major League Soccer announced as well as the 2020 playoff format. Five months to the day. I mean, look, I still remember March 12th as if it was yesterday. I remember us sitting there getting the news going home, me getting groceries, and then no soccer games being played after that. Well, five months of the day, MLS is going to be back in market. That's on Wednesday. Dallas, Nashville, in Dallas, Toyota Stadium. They'll do it again on Sunday. Nashville will fly to Dallas same day, play, fly back, do the same thing Sunday, and then they'll make up that other game with Nashville uh, at Nashville at a later date. Those will be the three regular season games that they missed as part of missing the MLS's back tournament. There are six games per club announced right now in what they're calling Phase 1. Canada is not included, which I'll explain in a second. Those are games through September 14th, so basically a month's worse. Uh, early September, we should get the rest of the games, which is 12 more games per team to make it 18. Some good dates for you to remember. Decision Day, November 8th. And then the Audi MLS Cup playoffs uh, will start on November 20th and end with MLS Cup on December 12th. This time around, 18 clubs, up from 14 last year, will qualify. That's 18 of 26. So it is more than half. It makes sense to me, but we'll talk about that more in a second as far as the competition goes. Canada, you know the travel restrictions. You know the issues that are happening with that. Right now, MLS is working to try to find a solution for the Canadian clubs regarding their plans at the regular season. More details coming, but you've probably seen the reports. Maybe Toronto FC playing at Red Bull Arena, along with NYCFC, by the way. 
maybe the impact in the U.S. as well, says their CEO, Kevin Gilmore. And then The Athletic is reporting that the Caps are looking at Portland as a possible place to play. As it pertains to COVID, protocol, learned from Orlando, honed, regular testing of players, coaches, and staff every other day, the day before matches. This is big news. All teams will travel via chartered flights and buses if it's a shorter trip. In most markets, they'll arrive on match day and depart immediately afterwards. And there is uh, news from Commissioner Don Garber that he's working with the league and the Players Association on a policy for player conduct outside of training and matches. Basically, what's expected to make sure that you don't have outbreaks like we saw with Nashville and FC Dallas. You saw the news. There will be certain places where there are fans in the stadium. Uh, Clubs are having to submit plans. they got to follow the guidelines by MLS's infectious disease doctors and follow protocols established by the states themselves, local governments, and the CDC. Uh, Commissioner Don Garber said Saturday that no plans had been approved, um, but we're starting to see clubs come out and talk about those plans. You can see that news at the club sites. I don't have time to go through it right now. I don't have all the details. It's not all concrete. I did see the CEO of Sporting Kansas City uh, say that everyone will have to wear a mask who comes in the stadium. It'll be 14% capacity, which is, I don't even think, 2,000 people. Uh, they'll have temperature checks coming in, and they won't be allowed within 20 feet of any player. So, look, I'm sure everybody has their, their own opinions on that sort of stuff, but uh, I will leave it to you to go gather more information. And as it becomes more solid, we'll talk about it a little bit more. So, just big picture. It's back. We knew that it would come back eventually. We now have sort of the beginning details. Um, I'll just kind of start this out. I'm a, I'm a cynic. Uh, I had COVID. I, I'm just, as a person, sometimes I look at sort of the potential for negative things to happen. And I felt that way about MLS's back at the very beginning. But I think MLS, outside of the beginning with Dallas and, Dallas and Nashville, proved via all these rounds of testing of zeros that they have something that's working. And I'm certainly going to give the benefit of the doubt uh, right now, given that the players have to agree, be involved, and the league is there for them to make the right decisions and do the right things. Now, Commissioner Don Garber did say that he understands things can happen, and we've seen that in other sports. Here's the quote, and I'll just read it to you. We know that we might have issues that are going to disrupt us and force us to postpone games. We are aware of the need to be flexible, and we're aware that we're entering a new normal for our industry. What we're doing here is getting it started. We believe we have a good plan, and we believe our players and our staff are focused on adhering to our protocols. And if we're able to do that, we should be able to get our games in. If we can't do that in a way that's safe, Uh, and one that's ensuring the health of our players, then we'll address it. If it doesn't work, then we won't move forward. So that's the right thing to do and say, and we certainly expect that from the commissioner who's kind of led these efforts uh, throughout this pandemic on MLS's side. I'm excited to see soccer. I was excited to see MLS's back. It was a big hole in my life that is back. I'm also, just like everybody else, concerned, number one, about the health and safety of everybody else. Um, So we'll monitor this as it happens, uh, and it'll start Wednesday in Dallas with Nashville and Dallas. Now, okay, let's talk about the competitive side of this. Uh, I think it's Frankenstein. This whole season is. It's severed body parts just kind of being sewn together into something both terrifying and inspirational. Uh, but it's what you have to do to to play. Um, I think the fact that it's not balanced is understandable. Again, those sorts of things kind of go out the window. I think the fact that they're expanding the playoffs – Makes sense. We don't know that every team is going to be able to play every game that they're scheduled. It's not a balanced format, so it might have to go to points per game, says Commissioner Garber. Um, I think it makes sense to do it again. You're basically having a big single elimination tournament. You're having another awesome event to showcase your players and to put them in an environment to thrive competitively and to prove something. So I think it makes all sense in the bizarre world that we're living in. What stands out to you guys just competitively on the field for these teams? And Dave, I guess we'll start with you. I just think we saw a bunch. Well, there was a lot of question marks coming into MLS's back. You had a ton of new coaches. You had two new teams. You had some teams that had rebuilt their identity, like a Chicago. And it was cool to see it all come together for some teams. Didn't yet for others. So I think the most exciting part is what's the next evolution for a lot of these groups? Where does Columbus go? Uh, what can Chicago become? Uh, what can Miami do? with more time and potentially more players, at least LGP we know. So I think there was a lot of unknowns. There was a few half answers out of MLS's back. I think Orlando being one of the huge ones. It's going to be cool to see how does that continue. And obviously you said it, inbound schedule. So this is not an exact answer of how this team will perform in a normal MLS season, maybe at the end, but it'll be fun to see who is real and what are the pieces going forward that clubs are going to build around who are the coaches that are established? I mean, however weird it was, Vancouver got out of the group stage. 
that alone was an accomplishment for them. We didn't know what they'd be. That was without five starters and a DP. So what's their progression? I think there's a lot of those question marks that we got little bits of at MLS is back. And now we're going to get bigger chunks of what they are. And I'm excited to see that. For me, it's, it's continuing to see the progress that some of these clubs have made Orlando in particular. Um, what, what's, what's it going to be like with a regular season with clubs knowing how they play now, can they keep it up? Can they keep improving? Um, because you've seen them make so many, uh, teams make change their styles and, and and just play for a tournament style, you know, where it's defend, look to counter, just be defensively sound and you not really worry about trying to score goals or being on the front foot. Well, when you talk about regular season, you have to be aggressive at times. You have to change your style. You have to adapt. So how will teams do that moving forward? And then Philadelphia union, you saw Brandon Aronson, you saw Mark McKenzie. Will they be gone? Yeah. Will they be sold? You know, you what are the changes? Issues. What are, what are those changes? Um, so I'm really excited to see how some of these teams play out. And then Minnesota, defend, defend, counterattack, make it predictable. It worked in the tournament. Well, now moving forward, when you have guys back healthy, Kevin Molino is back and fit, and we saw how he looked coming into the game. Mason Toy. Oh, boy. What, what happens with Mason Toy moving forward? Do you trade him? Do you play him? Um, uh, those those are, are some of the things I'm looking forward to seeing. Do you get the defender? That, of the you year know, back? Charlie's worked a lot with me over the last month. He just blows right through a hot boy scream. That's <laughs> yeah, how yeah, great Charlie Davis hot is. Hot boy! Oh, God. Gotta love a hot boy. What do you think about the playoffs, though? And then we'll get to a game uh, to watch and, and jump into uh, the transfers because Plasma Tweedy looks like he's coming to Inter Miami, but uh, the playoffs, what Marshall. aspect of that does it make sense? Well, I, I, I mean, to me, nine or 18 teams seems weird but like i guess there are reasons for doing it i just i'm approaching it as like, look there are a lot of league of mx fans on this you know podcast and we all watch the apertura we all watch the clausura and it always feels like a sprint and this is just going to be the the mls version of that you have an 18 game season you have to you know figure out how to be standing there at the end and then you get to the playoffs and it's a three week I think, yeah, about three weeks of just a, a bloodbath. And you know, we, we see that every single year, twice a year with the way Liga MX does it. And now uh, we're going to get a taste of that in MLS. So I, it, it, to me, this whole setup just feels very familiar. We have uh, the schedule through September 14th, six games for most teams. Again, Canada's TBD. We'll see what happens there. Uh, the game with the most juice is clearly Orlando at Atlanta. This is the opportunity, baby. August 29th, go to Mercedes-Benz, slap them around a little bit, talk some trash, take Orlando back. Like, if I was Orlando and I won, I would be chanting and, like, throwing that that mock straight back in Atlanta's face forever. I would, like, take that on as my rally and cry. Like, you wanted to crush me with that? We weren't crushed. We're turning it around. You're in disarray. That game has the most juice. Maybe a first W against Atlanta. That, that one's for me. Plus, what will Atlanta be? I have no idea. Interim coach, bunch of changes, Jurgen Dom, whoever else. Like, that's the game. What do you got, Charlie? What's your game? Portland, San Jose. Well, don't uh, sell it too hard there. My God. New York, like. New York City FC, Columbus. Uh, uh, to be honest, there, there's not one game that I'm like, oh, I can't wait. I need that. It, they're they're all, all of them. I want to see how uh, Iowa Canola, oh, wow. how oh, Iowa Canola just went with all games? Oh, yeah. God, not, Charlie. There's not like, oh, I can't wait for that Atlanta Orlando match. It's gonna be so much fun. All right, trim it, trim Charlie, trim Charlie. What's yours, Dave? <laughs> I would say though, the most juice that came out of the tournament was probably DC Toronto and LAFC Orlando, and none of them are gonna play each other, so that takes a little bit away. I'm gonna say RSL Colorado to open things up, rivalry, and I think a lot of question marks on both teams, but a lot of potential to be really exciting. Colorado fell flat in this tournament. RSL maybe surprised me uh, and i'm excited to see what freddy juarez can do with that team going forward so boom that's my go, go keep it quick so we can hit the transfers producer chris I mean, says i have to cut that and i don't want to I, I think we'd be hit it right orlando versus atlanta is the big one though i am pretty hyped for this dallas versus nashville home and home that we're going to see uh this coming week the dashville derby all right, let's welcome to Extra Time an AT&T call to the field. Walker Zimmerman of Nashville SC. A lot to talk about getting back to it, Walker. But first, it's a TAM party, baby. 
new contract extension Woo-hoo! time let's go <laughs> congratulations man how do you thank feel? you i appreciate it oh i feel unbelievable really excited um excited to be part of nashville excited to have security commitment from the club and and the city and i'm ready to get to work so just explain how being traded at the last minute to a team who now you haven't gotten to play games you hadn't really about got to be together you haven't really gotten to explore the city how does your mindset work then in getting to an extension and saying this is where i want to be yeah you know i think a lot of it for me is i've always been a loyalist pretty much in everything i do it's like i i get to a club if they believe in me i'm i'm giving everything i have for them it's been that way my whole career and ultimately with nashville um as soon as the trade happened you know i've talked a lot about them saying all the right things and at the end of the day they, they came and backed it up and showed their commitment level um and, and i'm i couldn't be more excited to play for a team that believes in me play for a city that believes in me and give everything i have to, to try and make it work and win championships now normally those canned quotes walker are pretty boring and i read the press release what was smashville i mean come on where, where is this hey, i'm just i'm in the culture now dude i'm here <laughs> part of the city i was bummed about the preds going out like i said i'm a loyalist let's go preds man next oh, year's man. here you're saying all the right things too. Let's let's just rewind a little bit. And the big news with the club, and everybody knows it, and you missed out on MLS's back. Um, tell me how it felt to to have that moment of all right, we're gonna play and then have to pull out both as an individual, but within the team structure as well. I mean, obviously, it's very disappointing. Um, you work so hard, and especially the year had already been postponed um essentially you know you'd had your second preseason already by this point getting ready for the mls's back tournament you get down there um you've been training for months with no positive tests you get a positive um all of a sudden you know how that how that plays out um you get a few more realize you're out of the tournament come back home quarantine enter into a third preseason because you've had 20 days of nothing um so, you know, mentally, I mean, it takes a, a lot of strength, a lot of fortitude for guys to, to continue to do things on their own. Uh, the club did a great job while we were at least in Orlando to set up daily Zooms where we're working out. You know, I, I had turned my AC off in my room, just trying to get a massive sweat on. Um, but it's tough, like no balconies, no fresh air. It didn't go outside for probably seven days out of the 10 that we were down there. We didn't really get permission until, you know, day seven, eight, nine, that type of thing. Uh, to get out in a parking lot and at least run and open the legs. But before that, it was running from the door about 20 feet the other way to the, the other wall. So, you know, mentally it was um, it was difficult. It was frustrating. It felt like, um, you know, you put in all this work and, and you can't go out and prove it. And so that aspect was was tough to deal with. But, you know, I think coming back, guys did a good job on their own of staying fit. And now we've gotten to train for probably two and a half weeks now uh, before our first game. So uh, we're pretty excited to finally get our return to play um, underway. For you, we kind of talked about it while we were waiting for you to come on, but the trade last minute, then the tornadoes in Nashville, which was a huge effort for all of you players on your team that were affected the whole community. Then you come back from Portland after the amazing first game. And then the COVID-19 layoff and then everything that happens with MLS is back. Have you caught a breath? Do you feel any of this happening or is it just trying to keep your eyes down? Yeah, I'll add on that. There have been some crazy storms. Our house actually got hit by lightning. Um, So we're running on like a third of our lights and fans working, um, not in our bedroom. We're having to sleep in another bedroom. (laughs) Basically, uh, there was like a power surge, shot like a nail. There's like a hole in our bedroom wall and it like freaked us out hard. I mean, I never you've been around storms where like you hear lightning close and it's like a loud crack and you're like, Whoa, like that was close. This was like, I was on the patio thinking it was nice and relaxing, watching an afternoon storm. And all of a sudden, I mean, the loudest bang of all time. And I like double checked my body. Cause I was like shaking. I was like, did I just get hit by lightning immediately? I'm like, Oh my gosh, Sally's inside. I run in, I'm like, Sally. She's like, Walker, <laughs> uh, you know, it was, it was chaos. Um, so it's, you're right. It's been such a tumultuous year for everyone. I mean, everyone has their own things that they're dealing with. Obviously, with Nashville, we've had, you know, things that are going to bring us closer as a community that are our hardships and things that you have to endure through. And so as a team, I think, you know, we're coming together, um, finding ways to stick together and, and cheer each other on. And, and ultimately, I think that's going to prepare us for our first game. So we'll talk about Dallas and, of course, 
the situation and coming back. But first, I mean, did you watch MLS's back? I mean, you can't participate, obviously, but did you watch the tournament? And, and what did you take away from it as somebody who's going to be competing against these same players here very soon? Uh, I watched a lot of it, you know, not quite every game, um, just with all the, the timings. And it's a lot watching three games in a day. Um, but it was really fun because it was always on every night. I'm like, oh, what game's on tonight? Which ones do I want to watch, pay attention to? I would say I watched probably 75% of, of the games that went on. Um, always fun to watch your friends, of course, but then also seeing, you know, teams and how they've changed from the year before, what teams are looking good, which teams are struggling, um, different players that are in the league. I mean, all of it's been really fun to watch and kind of uh, see how everything played out. And, and it made for a really cool format, you know, obviously wish that we could participate, but knockouts, knockout games always bring a lot of excitement. And I, I think, you know, MLS back proved that to be the same thing yet again. This is our yep. final prediction show, a finals prediction show, and we're going to have you alienate a fan base for no reason who will dislike yeah. you now. So you're good. Uh, Portland or Orlando? Yeah, you know, I'm going to go with Orlando. I'm going to I'm gonna ride the hot hand, I think. And Poppy? Uh, yeah, and Poppy, you know. Uh, obviously was under Oscar uh, for, for a few years and know how he prepares his teams to play, especially in these types of games. Uh, I think they're going to come out hot. You know, it's good to see Nani um, have a good tournament. Um, and ultimately I think, you know, that even though there's no fans, I think they are, it seems like they have this kind of vibe of like doing it for their city, even though there, there are no fans there. So, uh, not a knock on Portland. They've, they've been great. Uh, Blanco has certainly set himself a good tournament. Severice seems to have them, um, playing a lot better than they did the first two games of the season. Um, and they look like a completely different side. So that's a credit to him and their staff and their players, uh, of what they've done over the past couple of months. Of course, the final Tuesday night. Check that out. We'll uh, review it and go over every little detail uh, on Thursday with you. Let's look ahead here. And I, I think we have to start with sort of the obvious protocol stuff, Walker. Uh, the commissioner said that the league is working with the players union on policy for player conduct. You guys had the issues with COVID, had to pull out. Have you been informed? Is there any special protocol that you're having to follow or will be following a rule book that maybe you have or just like a personal sort of set of rules that you're going on? How do you make sure it doesn't happen again, I guess, is what I'm asking. Right. You know, I mean, there's no there's no foolproof way. Um, sometimes things are going to happen, even if you're being as safe as possible. And and that's what I think was frustrating as a club for us is because we're around each other every day. We see each other with masks on. Uh, you know, we we seemed as though we were doing everything just fine. And, and then we received kind of some backlash. It's like, oh, well, the training staff didn't do this or the technical staff didn't do this. And it's like, man, we, we were, we're doing everything properly. CDC protocols, you know, I, I can't speak to every teammate as to what they're doing, but my general understanding was, you know, everyone's taking this seriously, I had multiple conversations and meetings following up about the importance of it. Um, in terms of the, the PA getting with the league and this new conduct, I think there, there will be a phone call today where, where we're going to in-depth review of what that looks like. So I don't have a, a solid answer for you yet on that. That's this afternoon. Um, but, you know, it, it is important. It's it's safety protocols, and we need to be smart with it. Um, and at the same time, I, I'm hoping that these protocols are, are not just applicable to players, but this needs to be everyone who's in contact with players. You know, it's it's the entire staff, front office, anyone who's around. Um, it needs to be the same, and that's what I'm looking forward to uh, in that call later today is making sure everyone across the board is, is doing what they can to keep everyone safe. So we'll see what that looks like. Do you like, what's your level of comfort with all this? Like, do you feel comfortable? Yeah, I do. You know, we get tested every other day. Um, so we're going to catch it really early. Um, you know, our team, we also have been using whoop, uh, which is devices where I'm checking my respiratory rate every morning when I wake up and that's been, you know, it's not a hundred percent foolproof, but they've had a lot of success and a lot of, um, you know, predictability and, and whether you're, experiencing uh, COVID like symptoms through that respiratory rate. So I, I feel confident um, when I go to training that, you know, we, we are tested so regularly. Um, they're not going to miss it. It's every other day. And then the main thing is going to be, can we um, buckle down these, these traveling legs? Can we make sure that, um, you know, from everything that happens at the hotel while we're, even though we're flying the day of uh, staying in a hotel that day, flying back that night, can we make sure that, all the meals, all of these things are buttoned up as best as possible. And that would be the only thing that, that I would feel uncomfortable with, making sure that that needs to be 100% buttoned up. Uh, so we're going to take off your medical coat now and talk a little soccer. Perfect. For a quick second, if that's okay with you. No problem. Uh, 
it's going to be Dallas for you guys. Uh, head to head for a few times. That's an interesting one for you. As we talked about with Praya, you were there for a while. Uh, it's a meaningful club to you. How do you see the matchup and how interesting is it that that's where you get to return and get yourself going again with that team? Oh, it'll be great. You know, still have a lot of friends, a lot of good memories, obviously, of, of being in Dallas and winning a lot of games there. Um, it's still going to feel kind of like home field to me, played the most games on that field than any other one in, in the league. Um, so I'm excited. I'm excited to go back there, compete. They're a good team. Um, Lucci's got them uh, clicking a little bit. Uh, last year, we saw them uh, maintain the ball a little bit more than they had in the past. You know, before we were a, a very counterattacking team under Oscar. Obviously, Marl brought some creativity. Um, this team, they put in a little bit more um, pressing, a little bit more uh, with the front line. And then um, certainly having some young guys step up with my, with my buddies, Reggie Paxton, some of these exciting young players, they was having a good year last year. They got him his first cap. Um, you know, like I said, great friends, um, hardworking guys, and, and they're a hardworking team. So for us, it's going to be matching their intensity, um, playing in the heat as everyone always talks about with Dallas in the summer. Um, and how can we kind of dictate the tempo to make sure that, that we have our legs under us and can create some good opportunities? I mean, friends, but you want the three points. We've Absolutely. only seen you guys play twice. Tell me what to expect from this Nashville team. Is there a clear identity that you're going for? What drives this squad? Mm -hmm. Like, try to help us understand without seeing it what it right. might look like and what's important. Well, I think you're going to see a, a very a disciplined team, a well-organized team, um, a team that's trying to maintain – shape defensively, limit opponents' chances, similar to the first two games, um, where a lot a lot relies on that back six and how we defend uh, as a unit. Uh, and then offensively, I think that's where we could say after the first two games, how can we do more? Um, how can we create better one more matchups outside with our wingers, uh, get runners into the box on the ends of crosses? How can we get more numbers into the box um, to be a little bit more dangerous when it's out wide? Uh, and those are some of the things that we've been working on um, offensively to create some, hopefully, some more chances. We haven't gotten to see some of the guys on your team a whole lot in their careers because it was new guys and not that many games. Who's the one where you're in training? You're like, that is going to be beautiful when I see it against an opponent, not against me. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to, to guys who are new to this league. You look at Hani Mukhtar. You look at Randall Leal. Um, coming out of the wing and then you know Daniel Rios will, will get a shot up top um, how can these guys who are new to the league try and help have that learning curve be quick because um, we talk about it a lot sometimes guys come in from different leagues takes a little time to adjust how can we make that learning curve as quick as possible and get the attack going um, get a spark under us and create more opportunities I cover USL a lot so I've seen Rios a bit and I like the combination of what he is you're one of the best center backs in MLS uh, what is it that makes him hard? How successful can he be in this league? Yeah, well, he's good. He's a big target forward. Um, he has a decent hold-up play, and that's something that's been fun for me to kind of help him with is is the physicality of it. Is look like, you know, I you're a big guy. You need to be physical and not look for for calls. You need to hold people off. You need to be strong. Um, use that strength and not, you know, be a little bit soft. You need to make your presence known and felt. And so I think he's been, you know, improving every day in training, and then. Again, it comes down to you got to be clinical around goal. And even when you're doing shadow drills or finishing with no defenders, be precise, be vicious, and make sure that you're doing it at, at a top level so that when it comes in the game, you're ready. And so I think he's been working really hard um, to, to get on that page, and I'm excited to see what will what'll come for him. As far as MLS experience, you're kind of an old 27, let's call it, Walker. You got a good bit yeah. of it. You got a yeah. lot of guys on this team that have been through it, but you saw expansion and expansion success with LAFC. Is there anything from that situation? I know apples to oranges can't apply here that you say, okay, we got to do this here, or you're kind of passing on knowledge or learnings or helping guide guys. What did you learn? How do you apply it? I think mainly, I mean, it's such a, a buzzword, you know, you talk about culture and standards, but it, it really is important when you're starting out uh, with a new club. And, and what are the standards like, not only on game day, in terms of working and running for each other and being strong in the tackle and the challenge, but what are your standards as a pro individually every day that you show up to, to training? And I think LAFC, uh, you know, with all the leadership there, obviously Bob at the helm of that ship um, instilled that in, in our team. And I think uh, we're certainly on the right track with Nashville in terms of accountability. And, you know, it, it has taken some time to have guys find their voices of, hey, if something's wrong, you point it out and you get on to someone and say, hey, that's not good enough. And 
that's the only way you're going to grow. It's out of love. Um, it's only to make them better. And ultimately that makes us as a team better. So being accountable, having those standards, creating a culture of wanting to win and doing things the right way. Sounds cliche, but I think that's a good starting point for us as a, as a club. Yeah, I know when Dave hits me up and says, hey, keep your questions short, stop rambling. I know it's out of love. I know I always <laughs> always feel, you know, that's straight. That's just love from Dave. Ping, ping. You got to stay Absolutely. tight. Absolutely. Uh, two more before we let you go here. This is a, a set piece question. We know you're a monster on them, but I want to know your top three, whether you're marking or whether you're just watching the top three set piece threats for you and MLS right now outside of yourself. Wow. Um, you know, always tipping my hat to my fellow center back, Ike Opara. We had some good banter on the, the, the Benny podcast. Why am I blanking on the name of that? BSI, BSI man. BSI. Yes, I was like, yeah, Sal and Ike are about, mm, we're about to make this go viral. It didn't yeah. sound right. Yeah, it didn't sound right. But, you know, he had the conversation of, of who would I take an aerial duel. And I chose myself. You know, I got, I got confidence in that. But he's certainly up there. He's got a a good goal scoring ability. Um, we've seen him put some in the back of the net and then, uh, two more. Yeah. Let's say uh, you're marking him. Somebody's yeah, Kai, the park, like, Ooh. yeah. Kai Kamara always is good threat, you know, especially since he knocked me out last year. Um, <laughs> that was crazy. And then, uh, I'm going to go with, I mean, Kendall Watson, if you're marking him in the box, always a huge target. Sounds like pretty obvious choices, but no. again, those guys have had a lot of success, uh, scored a lot of goals with their head on set pieces. So, how do you, how do you, those guys come in the box on you? What's your thought process like? Are you thinking, I'm trying to get underneath them a little bit? Yeah. I'm trying to make sure they don't get their jump off. How do you defend those sorts well, of guys in a set piece situation? I mean, typically, typically I'm in a zone. Um, so I have someone else who's, who's marking them. But when those guys and, and people of prowess are on the other team, I'm very aware of their runs as the ball is about to be played and trying to see if they've gotten ahead of their guy, if I might need to help a little bit more and try and cheat a little bit more uh, before the ball is delivered or if I hold my zone. Um, so, but there's definitely a heightened awareness of where those guys are in particular as to my positioning and, and where I might try and put myself. Last one. It's gotta be this one. I see you on Twitter and on Instagram. I see you on Twitch. I see you with your little gaming pod. Yeah. Men's national team represent. It's like Jordan Morris with the rolled on yeah. brothers. Oh, Aaron yeah. Long, yourself, yep. tell us about this little pod, like what you guys are doing, who's the best, talk a little trash, yeah. roast Man, somebody. It's, it's so fun. I mean, we uh, lately it's been a lot of arena trios with, with Christian Roldan, Jordan Morris. Christian's our fearless leader. He's the best of the three. Jordan's <laughs> definitely second. I, I tell you what, no one will beat me in heart. I got a lot of heart in the game. <laughs> I'm a good medic. I'm a good teammate. If someone goes down, I'm there. Um, Aaron Long, uh, Congrats to him on the baby, by the way, but his Fortnite game has got to be in shambles because I haven't seen this guy online in weeks. So <laughs> that's disappointing. Um, Christian Pulisic, amazing Fortnite player as well. Um, we like to have him whenever whenever one of us is out. We got to have, have him sub in a little bit. He's, Ooh, he's yeah. really good can't, too. Can't have him in the first team, right? Got to make time, zone, time zones are a little weird for him. And, and also <laughs> he's playing on different servers, so he's lagging a little mm. bit. But that's like, mm. it, he's like, I'm lagging, I'm lagging. And it's like, come on, dude, you just got bought, you know? <laughs> Let me tell you about Aaron, though. Once you have the kid, the wife's not letting you just roll up on the Fortnite. I didn't yeah, know if, talk, if anybody didn't know. He talked a big have... game. He talked a big game before the baby. Like, oh, guys, I'll still be on. I'll still be a part of the squad. Like, trust me. And it's like, man, I, I don't. His account might be gone. Yeah, it might be gone. It might be gone. Walker, congratulations, man, on the new contract. We're looking forward to seeing you on Wednesday and then Sunday. Of course, people don't know. Two games in Frisco at Toyota Park, Nashville, FC Dallas. Best of luck. Thank you. I appreciate it. Big thanks to Walker Zimmerman for joining us from Tam Paradise, where he has a new three-year deal with uh, Nashville SC and a hole in his wall from Lightning, which uh, that was a terrifying story that I did not expect from him. Let's get to the transfer fund. The window opens on Wednesday in Major League Soccer. You might have seen the Agustin Almendra rumors, Miami or LA. You probably saw Wingham Bohm maybe moving to Russia or maybe Croatia. I think probably Russia more likely. Uh, FC Cincinnati, don't know if it's true or false. Mario Goza apparently undergoing a medical Again, don't know. This is that time of year. Uh, and Cecilio Dominguez, the Paraguay international that's been an independiente in Argentina, has been linked real heavily with Austin FC. But this is the big one. Blaze Matuidi to enter Miami. Uh, Paul McDonough, the GM, told us on this show that they were going to go after a number eight and they were going to add a difference maker. And they were going to try to add two difference makers in this window. Everybody's yelling, chatting about a number nine. But this is more of an eight 
maybe six. Okay, nobody's chatting about that, Doyle. Fine. Taylor Twelman. I, just... I think the people who are talking about number nines are, are being ridiculous because they've already invested millions in the number nine position with Carranza. They invested the number one overall draft pick with Robbie Robinson. The problem that we all saw with, with Miami was that was not chance finishing. It was chance creation, right? They don't have that. And part of it was that their deep lying midfield with Uyoa and Trapp, they're very similar players. So it was very static. The only time they looked dynamic at all were the occasional times when Uyoa was able to get forward and combine a little bit in attack, which is not his game. That is Blas Metuidi's game. Um, the question I have is, okay, is he here as a TAM player or is he here as a, a DP? Because when um, when Paul was on the show, he said we're going to have a DP, a DP attacker and a TAM number eight. And Matuidi is the number eight. You could pair him with either Trap or Uyoa. He fits snugly. I know he's – Older, um, so you're, prob you're probably not going to play him every single game. You're going to need some other reinforcements or one of the younger players to come good at that position. Uh, but that's a coach's job. But I, I like the signing for a lot of on-field reasons. I think he will make them much more dynamic on the attack, even though he's not the pure creative attacker that I think they also need on the three line of that 4-2-3-1. My first, my first match in France, uh, friendly against Saint Etienne, uh, he was in the midfield, and I remember being so impressed. I, I, he stood out heads and shoulders above anybody else on the on the club, and I thought, wow, this this guy is talented. And next thing you know, he, he's he's making the moves across Europe, playing for the top clubs. He he is he is a great player. There's no doubt about it. He will add a ton of value to Inter Miami and what they're trying to do. Now, as far as that, that name that's going to be like, whoa, grab all the attention, that's not Matuidi. And it's similar to the, the style of play that he has in the field. He's not going to garner all that attention that a, a typical DP will with all the goals and assists. But we, what you will get from him is timely tackles. He'll keep possession. He'll organize the midfield. He, he's calm in possession. Uh, he, can, he can play both ways. It, as much as he will add to the, the offensive part of Inter-Miami and how they flow, he's going to be – instrumental as far as defensively uh, being in the right spots get having guys fill in the gaps and, and breaking up plays and and uh winning second balls i think blasma tweedy makes a lot of sense as far as how they're going to play on the field and, and being that that fulcrum in the middle but as far as like that the name recognition in inter miami you want those massive signings that everyone wants uh, the photos and the dp signing you're not getting it with him but he will deliver on the field i'm sure of that what both of you said is if he's a TAM signing, it's fine. If he's a DP, then there's a problem for this team because they won't be able to create enough opportunities if he's the last DP that they're going to bring in. Uh, he doesn't do that. That's not his game. So he can add to that. But if he's the D DP signing, you're not going to get the peak of Pissarro, and he's not going to be good enough to make this team competitive in the Eastern Conference at the top five level. So maybe you're getting into the playoffs, but that's it. If it is a TAM signing, as to Doyle's point, we believe that he's been bought out of his contract, so there wouldn't be a transfer fee with Juventus because they have a bunch of changes going on, so they're just trying to get players off their books. Uh, and if he's getting bought out, maybe he feels like he can take a little bit of a pay cut to come to MLS because he wants to live in Miami. He knows David Beckham. He wants to play there for the end of his career. Then that's all fantastic, and he can be a huge part of it. And while he's not the biggest name, I think right now everyone that was part of that France World Cup team has a little bit of shine on them. Everyone wants to be a part of that. They were fun. They were exciting. They're a great group. Uh, and if this is the first steps to getting Paul Pogba in MLS, then thank you. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Not, if it's, Paul, it's, it's Antoine Griezmann, isn't it? Like every single yeah, player, I don't, I don't post care on about Instagram Griezmann. and Griezmann's up in the comments just with like prayer hands and fire you emojis need, and heart Pogba eyes. Nation. You need Pogba Nation in MLS, <laughs> but so Matuidi's not any of those players, but he fits in well if there's more pieces coming in to add creativity. I will oh, say man. this. With LGP and Matuidi, I, I think this is a playoff team. I really do. But I do think they need that. So, But if Matuidi's a DP, right, what do you think of, like, reportedly Victor Vasquez wants back into MLS. Could get him – as a TAM number 10, and you couldn't play him every game. You, you might not play even play him every game. It's geriatric midfield. Was, oh, well, no, don't do that to them. I'm 34. Don't, don't do that to I'm them. I'm 34. Look at, look at Diego Chara. He 
looks like he's 25. Yeah, he he's plays next to a kid. The place. <laughs> Stop it. Get Don't out do that in Miami in that Don't heat. Do Don't do that to them. All right, let us know what you think about uh, the rumors. They're not yet official, but it's looking like it's going that way. Blasma tweeted, enter Miami. Mailbag time. Email us, extra time at soccer.com. 401-2060 MLS. Is that the uh, bam, bam? You still got it. You still got it. Got it. Got it. Still All right. What do we got, Dave? What's the uh, good stuff? Hank from Salt Lake City who says, what's more fun? Family members on the same team like the Chara brothers when Yimmy's healthy. Jimmy's healthy or family members on competing teams. There's two McGlynn brothers in USL. What's better? I think we've got the Beaslers in MLS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, but the, yeah, that had a little bit of juice every once in a while. They got into a couple like just kind of like they were yapping each other via the referee a couple times. But I think it's all about profile, right? Like you need you need guys that are going to have some sort of connection. Like if they're on the same team, like the Chara bros, they need to like launch a counterattack together and then celebrate together somehow. Or if they're on opposing teams, yeah. they got to beef a little bit. I think it's wherever you get the most interaction, that's the most fun. Like if we just, had Ronald DeBoer in, in coaching in MLS and Frank. <laughs> no. like, now we're talking. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, that could be fun. You know? Might be short-lived, but yeah, it yeah. could be fun. <laughs> it could be fun. What else we got? Uh, Dave Spitzberger. I don't know if we did this one, but does anyone else think Jurgen Klinsmann to Atlanta United makes a ton of sense? Boy, we hit, <laughs> we hit that like three weeks after it was all the rage on Twitter, huh? Yeah. Uh, Oh boy, I don't think I mean, you're gonna make sense anywhere. No, no, he's got his money. He's got his money. They have a chopper pad at the training facility in Atlanta, or no? Because that might be make or break for him. Okay, mm -hmm. so Weeby, we saved this one for you, and then oh, we'll no. end. Oh god. Uh, Burke from Maryland says, "From today to the end of their career, who scores more MLS goals, BWP or Wanda?" Oi, uh, Oy. boy. Uh, so either way, I just get to slander a legend. Is that what? Either I, way, you're going to be wrong. And we're going to slam it back in your face. Correct. It doesn't matter which um, one. You pick. I think BWP oh, has more than one year. And Wando, well, and Wando kind of, he acted like maybe he would be back for more. I'm going to say BWP because it just feels like that team is built to just feed him the ball. And Wando hasn't been starting for San Jose. So I don't know if he's going to be have as many minutes, but he's super productive. And I already did that to Wando. So he's probably maybe okay with it. So I'm going to say BWP. The correct answer the correct answer all along was Kai Kamara. Boom. Got to think outside the box, Weeby. Oh, my Rejecting God. Rejecting all binaries. Uh, thanks, Mom. Gas man for president. Make him the full-time host. Yeah, just had to read that one. I feel like, Hey, Sandy. Sandy, I'm a big fan. Big yeah. fan of, of you. Big fan of David as well. That's it for us. It was a pleasure to be back. Watch the final on Tuesday, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, ESPN in the U.S., TSN TVA. Over in Canada, we'll be back on Thursday, everybody. Enjoy your week.